Hi everyone, this is Kavya from Edureka. Welcome to today's session on Project Management 101. Before we begin, I'd like to address the agenda. Firstly, there'll be an introduction to what is project. Once we understand the basics of project, we'll dive through the history of project management, how management was brought into the picture of project planning and creation. Then we'll move ahead and talk about why do organizations really need project management and how do they implement it. Moving on, we'll discuss who is a project manager and also some of the tools that will support them. Then we will also discuss the project management life cycle and we will discuss its major principles, all of its performance domains and conclude this session by discussing the project management certifications that are available in the market today. We will discuss the most prominent certification and how to go about with its preparation. I hope the agenda is clear. Introduction to project. Firstly, let us understand what is a project. People have been undertaking projects since the earliest days of organized human activity. The hunting parties of our prehistoric ancestors were projects. Let me explain this with an example. There were temporary undertakings directed at the goal of obtaining meat for the community. Large complex projects have also been with us for a really long time. The pyramids and the Great Wall of China were in their day of roughly the same dimensions as the Apollo project to send men to the moon. We use the term project frequently in our daily conversations. For example, in a conversation, anyone could say my main project for this weekend is to straighten out the garage. Going hunting, building pyramids and fixing faucets all share certain features that make them projects. There are many written definitions of a project. All of them contain some key elements. For those looking for a formal definition of a project, the Project Management Institute defines a project as a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or even a result. The temporary nature of projects really indicates a definite beginning and end. The end is reached when the project's objectives have been achieved or when the project is terminated because its objectives will not or cannot be met or when the need for the project no longer exists. So a project also has distinctive attributes that really distinguish it from ongoing work or business operations. They are basically very temporary in nature. They're not an everyday business process and definitely have a start date and end date. This characteristic is extremely important because a large part of the project effort is really dedicated to ensuring that project is completed at the appointed time. To do this, schedules are created showing when tasks should begin and end they can last for minutes, hours, days, months, or even years. Projects really exist to bring about a product or service that really hasn't existed before. In this sense, a project mostly is extremely unique. Unique means that this is new, that has never been done before. Maybe it's been done in a very similar fashion before, but never exactly in the same way. So let me explain this point with an example. The Ford Motor Company is in the business of designing and assembling cars. Each model that Ford designs and produces can be considered a project. The models obviously differ from each other in their features and are marketed to people with various needs. An SUV serves a different purpose from that of a luxury car. The design and marketing of these two models are unique projects. However, the assembly of the cars is considered an operation that is a repetitive process that is followed for most makes and models. In contrast with projects, Operations are ongoing and repetitive. They involve work that is continuous without an ending date, with the same process repeated to produce the same results. The purpose of operations is really to keep the organization functioning, while the purpose of project is to really meet its goals and conclude. Therefore, operations are ongoing, whereas projects are unique and temporary. I hope the difference between operations and projects are clear to you. A project obviously has goals and objectives that are supposed to be accomplished. It is these goals that really drive the project and all the planning and implementation efforts undertaken to achieve them. Sometimes projects end when it is determined that the goals and objectives cannot be accomplished or when the product or service of the project is no longer needed and the project is cancelled. Now that we've clearly discussed what is a project and also have mentioned the differences between project and operations, let's move on and check out the project characteristics. So when considering whether or not you have a project in your hand, there are some things to keep in mind. 
Firstly, you will have to question yourself. Ask, is it a project or an ongoing operation? Second, if it is a project, who are the stakeholders? And third question you'd ask yourself is what characteristics really distinguish this endeavor as a project? Project has three characteristics. Firstly, as I've already mentioned before, projects are temporary in nature. That is, they have a definite start and end point. Okay, second thing is projects are completed when the project goals are achieved or it is determined the project is no longer viable. So once the end point is reached, the project is considered done. The third one is projects are unique. That is, it is attempting to achieve something new. Now, a successful project is one that meets or exceeds the expectation of the stakeholders. Consider the following scenario. The vice president of marketing approaches you with a fabulous idea. He wants to set up Kisco's in local grocery stores as mini offices. These offices will offer customers the ability to sign up for car and home insurance services as well as make their bill payments. He believes that the exposure in grocery stores will increase awareness of the company's offerings. He told you that senior management has already cleared the project and he will dedicate as many sources to this as he can. He wants the new KS goes in place in 12 selected stores in a major city by the end of the year. Finally, he is assigned you to head up this project. Your first question should be, is it a project? This may seem very elementary, but confusing projects with ongoing operations happens pretty often. Projects are temporary in nature. They have definite start and end dates, result in the creation of a unique product or service and are completed when the goals and objectives have been met and signed off by the stakeholders. Using these criteria and keeping these points in mind, we can examine the assignment from the vice president of marketing to determine if it is really a project. So the first question that you would ask yourself is, is it unique? Yes, because the kioscos do not exist in the local grocery stores. This is a new way of offering the company's services to its customer base. While the service the company is offering isn't really new, the way it is presenting its service is. The second question is, does the product have a limited time frame? The answer would definitely be yes. The start date of this project is today and it will end by the end of next year. It is definitely a temporary endeavor. Third one is, is there a way to determine when the project is completed? Yes, the key scores will be installed and the services will be offered from them. So once all of these are installed and operating, the project will come to an end. The last question that you would ask yourself is, is there a way to determine stakeholder satisfaction? And again, the answer is yes. The expectations of the stakeholders will be documented in the form of requirements during the planning processes. These requirements will be compared to the finished product to determine if it meets the expectations of the stakeholder. Now, if the answer is yes to all of these questions, then we have a project. Now that we've discussed its characteristics with an example, let's move ahead and check out the project constraints. On any project, you will definitely have a number of project constraints that are competing for your attention. Some of them are cost, scope, quality, risk, resources, and time. Cost is the budget approved for the project, including all necessary expenses needed to deliver the project. Within organizations, project managers have to balance between not running out of money and not underspending because many projects receive funds or grants that have contract clauses with a use it or lose it approach to project funds. Poorly executed budget plans can result in a last minute rush to spend the allocated funds. For virtually all projects, cost is ultimately a limiting constraint. Few projects can go over budget without eventually requiring a corrective action. The second constraint is scope. So scope is what the project is really trying to achieve. It entails all of the work involved in delivering the project outcomes and the processes used to produce them. It is basically the reason and the purpose of the project. The third constraint is quality. Quality is a combination of the standards and criteria to which the project's products must be delivered for them to perform effectively. The product must perform to provide the functionality expected, solve the identified problem, and deliver the benefit and values as expected. It must also meet other performance requirements or service levels, such as availability, reliability, and maintainability, and have acceptable finish and polish. Quality on a project is controlled through quality assurance, which is basically the process of evaluating overall project performance 
on a very regular basis to provide confidence that your project will satisfy the relevant quality standards. Then we have risk, which is defined by potential external events that will have a negative impact on your project if they occur. Risk refers to the combination of the probability the event will occur and the impact on the project if the event ever occurs. Now, if the combination of the probability of the occurrence and the impact on the project is very, very high, you should definitely identify the potential event as a risk and put a proactive plan in place to manage the risk. Then we have resources. You can think of resources too as a constraint, right? Because here you're required to carry out the project tasks. They can be people, equipment, facilities, funding, or anything else capable of definition required for the completion of a project activity. Finally, the most important constraint is time. Time is obviously defined as the time period allocated to you to complete the project. Time is often the most frequent project oversight in developing projects. This is reflected in missed deadlines and incomplete deliverables. Proper control of the schedule requires the careful identification of tasks to be performed and accurate estimations of the durations, the sequence in which they're going to be done and how people and other resources are to be allocated. Any schedule should take into account vacations and holidays. Now moving on, if you know the basics of project management, I'm sure you must have come across the term triple constraint, which traditionally consisted of only time, cost and scope. These are the primary competing project constraints that you have to be most aware of. The triple constraint is illustrated in the form of triangle to visualize the project work and see the relationship between the scope or quality, schedule or time and cost or resource. Your project may have additional constraints that you must face and as the project manager, you will have to balance the needs of these constraints against the needs of the stakeholders and your project goals. Let me explain this with an example. If your sponsor wants to add functionality to the original scope, you will very likely need more money to finish the project. Or if they cut the budget, you will have to reduce the quality of your scope. And if you do not get the appropriate resources to work on your project tasks, you will obviously have to extend your schedule because the resources you have take much, much longer to finish the work. You get the idea, right? The constraints are all dependent on each other. Think of all of these constraints as the classic carnival game of whack-a-mole. Each time you try to push one more back in the hole, another one pops out. The best advice here is to rely on a project team to keep these moles in place. Now that we have discussed constraints in detail, let us talk about must-have areas of expertise in a project team. Now by standards, we mean guidelines or preferred approaches that are not necessarily mandatory. In contrast, when referring to regulations, we mean mandatory rules that must be followed, such as government imposed requirements through laws. It should go without saying that as a professional, you are required to follow all applicable laws and rules that apply to your industry, organization, or even the project. I'm sure you must be aware that every industry has some set of standards and regulations, right? Knowing which ones really affect your project before you begin your work will not only help the project to unfold smoothly, but it will also give you an opportunity for effective risk analysis. Some projects require specific skills in certain application areas. Application areas are made up of categories of projects that have common elements. They can be defined by industry group like pharmaceutical, financial, etc. Department like accounting, marketing, legal, etc. Even in technology like software development, engineering, etc or obviously management specialities like procurement, research and development. These application areas are usually concerned with disciplines, regulations and the specific needs of the project, the customer or the industry. Now, let me explain this with an example. Most government agencies have specific procurement rules that apply to the projects that wouldn't be applicable in the construction industry. The pharmaceutical industry is interested in regulations set forth by government regulators, whereas the automotive industry has little or no concern for either of these types of regulations. You need to stay up to date regarding your industry so that you can apply your knowledge effectively. Today's fast paced advances can leave you far behind quickly if you do not stay abreast of your current trends. And also having some level of experience in the application area you're working in will give you an advantage when it comes to project management. While you can call in experts who have the application area knowledge, 
it doesn't hurt for you to understand the specific aspects of the application areas of your project. Now that we have discussed the areas of expertise, let's move ahead and understand the project environment. So what would be the right environment for you to accomplish the goals that you've set for your project? Now, obviously, there are many factors that really need to be understood within your project environment. At one level, you need to think in terms of cultural and social environments, that is people, demographics and education. The international and political environment is where you really need to understand about different countries, cultural influence, etc. Then we move to the physical environment. Here we think about time zones. Think about different countries and how differently your project will be executed, whether it is just in your country or if it involves an international project team that is distributed throughout the world in five different countries. Of all the factors, the physical ones are the easiest to understand and it is the cultural and international factors that are often misunderstood and ignored. How we deal with clients, customers or project members from other countries can be very critical to the success of the project. So let me take an example. The culture of the United States values accomplishments and individualism. Americans tend to be informal and call each other by first names, even if having just met. On the other hand, Europeans tend to be more formal, using surnames instead of first names in a business setting, even if they know each other well. In addition, their communication style is much more formal than in the United States. And while they tend to value individualism, they also value history, hierarchy, and loyalty. The Japanese, on the other hand, tend to communicate indirectly and consider themselves part of a group, not as individuals. The Japanese value hard work and success, as most of us do. How a product is received can be very dependent on the international cultural differences. For example, back in the 1990s, when many American and European telecommunication companies were cultivating new markets in Asia, the customers' cultural differences often produce unexpected situations. Western companies plan their telephone systems to work the same way in Asia as they did in Europe and the US. But the protocol of conversation is very different, right? Call waiting, a popular feature in the West, is considered impolite in some parts of Asia. This cultural blunder could have been avoided had the team captured the project environment requirements and involved the customer. It is often the simplest things that can cause trouble since unsurprisingly in different countries people do things differently. Another example would be date formats, right? What day and month is 2-8-2019? Of course, it depends where you come from. In North America, that's February 8th, while in Europe, it is 2nd August. Clearly, when schedules and deadlines are being defined, it is most important that everyone is clear on the format used. Project managers in multicultural projects must appreciate the culture dimensions and try to learn relevant customs, courtesies, and business protocols before taking responsibility for managing an international project. A project manager must take into consideration this various cultural influences and how they may affect the project's completion, schedule, scope, and cost. Moving on to the next part of the session, we will be discussing about interpersonal skills. Last but not the least, you also have to bring the ability into the project to manage personal relationships and deal with personal issues as they arise. Here we are talking about your interpersonal skills. Project managers spend 90% of their time communicating. So this is one of the most important interpersonal skills, communication. This is why they must be good communicators, promoting clear, unambiguous exchange of information. As a project manager, it is your job to keep a number of people well informed. It is essential that your project staff know what is expected of them, what they have to do, when they have to do, and what budget and time constraints and quality specifications they're working towards. If the project staff members do not really know what their tasks are or how to accomplish them, then the entire project will grind to a halt. If you do not know what the project staff is or often is not doing, then you will be unable to monitor project progress. Finally, if you're uncertain of what the customer expects of you, then the project will not even get off the ground. Project communication can thus be summed up as knowing who needs what information and when and making sure they have it. All projects require sound communication plans, but not all projects will have the same types of communication or the same methods for distributing the information. For example, will information be distributed via mail or email? Is there a shred website or are face-to-face -face meetings required? 
the communication management plan documents how the communication needs of the stakeholders will be met including the types of information that will be communicated who will communicate them and who will receive them the methods used to communicate the timing and frequency of the communication the method for updating the plan as the project progresses including the escalation progress and a glossary of common terms the second one is influence project management is about getting things done every organization is different in its policies modes of operations and underlying culture there are political alliances differing motivations conflicting interests and power struggles here a project management must understand all of the unspoken influences at work within the organization the next obvious skill that you must have is leadership leadership is the ability to motivate and inspire individuals to work toward expected results leaders inspire vision and rally people around common goals a good project manager can motivate and inspire the project team to see the vision and value of the project the project manager as a leader can inspire the project team to find a solution to overcome perceived obstacles to get the work done moving on we have motivation motivation is a constant process that the project manager must guide to help the team move toward completion with passion and a profound reason to complete the work motivating the team is accomplished by using a variety of team building techniques and exercises team building is simply getting a diverse group of people to work together in the most efficient and effective manner possible this may involve management events as well as individual actions designed to improve team performance recognition and awards are a very important part of team motivations they are formal ways of recognizing and promoting desired behavior and are most effective when carried out by the management team and the project manager consider individual preferences and cultural differences when using rewards and recognition some people do not like to be recognized in front of a group others really thrive on it then we have negotiation project managers obviously must be able to negotiate for the good of the project in any project the project manager the project sponsor and the project team will have to negotiate with stakeholders vendors and customers to really reach a level of agreement acceptable to all parties involved in the negotiation process then we finally have problem solving it is the ability to understand the heart of the problem look for a viable solution and then eventually make a decision to implement that solution the starting point for problem solving is problem definition problem definition is really the ability to understand the cause and effect of the problem this centers on root cause analysis if a project manager treats only the symptoms of a problem rather than its cause the symptoms will perpetuate and continue through the project life even worse treating a symptom may result in a very huge problem now for example increasing the ampere rating of a fuse in your car because the old ones keep blowing does not solve the problem of an electrical short that could result in a fire root cause analysis looks beyond the immediate symptoms to the cause of the symptoms which then affords opportunities for solutions once the root of a problem has been identified a decision must be made to effectively address the problem solutions can be presented from vendors the project team the project manager or various stakeholders a viable solution focuses on more than just the problem it looks at the cause and effect of the solution itself in addition a timely decision is needed or the window of opportunity may pass and then a new decision will be needed to address the problem as in most case the worst thing you can do is nothing all of these interpersonal skills will be used in all areas of project management start practicing now because it's guaranteed that you will need these skills on your next project now let's move ahead and discuss the history of project management in the history of project management we can chart all the major developments and events in the discipline as far back as there are records although there have been some form of project management since early civilization project management in the modern sense began in the 1950s so let's start from way back to 2570 bc when the great pyramid of giza completed the pharaohs built the pyramids and today archaeologists still argue about how they achieved this feat ancient records show there were managers for each of the four faces of the great pyramid responsible for overseeing their completion we know there was some degree of planning execution and control involved in managing this project then in 208 bc there was the construction of the great wall of china later still another wonder of the world was built 
since the Quinn dynasty, construction of the Great Wall had been a large project. According to historical data, the labor force was organized into three groups, soldiers, common people and criminals. The Emperor Quinn ordered millions of people to finish this project. Then in 1917, we have the Gantt chart developed by Henry Gantt. One of the forefathers of project management, Henry Gantt is best known for creating his self-named scheduling diagram, the Gantt chart. It was a radical idea and an innovation of worldwide importance in the 1920s. One of its first uses was on the Hoover Dam project that was started later on in the 1931. Gantt charts are still in use today and form an important part of the project manager's toolkit. Moving on to 1956, we have the American Association of Cost Engineers that was formed. Early practitioners of project management and the associated specialties of planning and scheduling, cost estimating, cost and schedule control from the AACE in 1956. It has remained the leading professional society for cost estimators, cost engineers, schedulers, project managers, and project control specialists ever since. American Association of Cost Engineers continued its pioneering work in 2006, releasing the first integrated process for portfolio, program and project management with a total cost management framework. Then in the 1957, the critical path method was invented by DuPont Corporation. CPM is a technique used to predict project duration by analyzing which sequence of activities has the least amount of scheduling flexibility. DuPont designed it to address the complex process of shutting down chemical plants for maintenance and then, with maintenance completed, restarting them. The technique was so successful, it saved the corporation $1 million in the first year of its implementation. Then in 1958, the, the program evaluation review technique was invented for the U.S. Navy's Polaris project. The U.S. Department of Defense's U.S. Navy Special Projects Office developed PERT as part of the Polaris Mobile Submarine Launch Ballistic Missile Project during the Cold War. PERT is a method for analyzing the tasks involved in completing a project, especially the time needed to complete each task and identifying the minimum time needed to complete the total project. In 1962, United States Department of Defense mandated the work breakdown structure approach. The U.S. Department of Defense created the WBS concept as part of the Polaris Mobile Submarine Launched Ballistic Missile Project. After completing the project, the DOD published the work breakdown structure it used and mandated the following of this procedure in future projects of this scope and size. WBS is an exhaustive hierarchical tree structure of deliverables and tasks that really need to be performed to complete a particular project. Later adopted by the private sector, the WBS remains one of the most common and useful project management tools. In 1965, the International Project Management Association was founded. IPMA was the world's first project management association, started in Vienna by a group as a forum for project managers to network and share information. Registered in Switzerland, the association is a federation of about 50 national and internationally oriented project management associations. Its vision is to promote project management and to lead the development of the profession. Since its birth in 1965, IPMA has grown and spread worldwide with over 1,20,000 members in 2012. Moving on to 1969, the Project Management Institute, that is PMI, launched to promote the project management profession. Five volunteers founded PMI as a non-profit professional organization dedicated to advance the practice, science and profession of project management. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania issued Articles of Incorporation for PMI in 1969, which signified its official start. During that same year, PMI held its first symposium in Atlanta, Georgia, and had an attendance of 83 people. Ever since then, the PMI has become best known as the publisher of a guide to the project management body of knowledge that is PMBOK, Considered as one of the most essential tools in the project management profession even today, the PMI offers levels of project management certification, certified associate in project management, and project management professional. We'll talk about PMP later on in the session. In 1975, Prompt 2 method created by Simpac Systems Limited. Development of Prompt 2 was in response to an outcry that computer projects were overrunning on time 
estimated for completion and original budgets as set out in feasibility studies. It was not usual to experience factors of double, treble or even 10 times the original estimates. PROM2 was really an attempt to set down guidelines for the stage flow of a computer project. In 1979, the UK government central computing and telecommunications agency adopted the method for all information systems project. Also in 1975, the Mythical Man Month Essays on Software Engineering was released by Fred Brooks. So in his book of Software Engineering and Project Management, Fred Brooks' central theme is that adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. This idea is called Brooks Law. The extra human communications needed to add another member to a programming team is much more than anyone ever expects. It naturally depends on the experience and sophistication of the human programmers involved and the quality of available documentation. Nevertheless, no matter how much experience they have, the extra time discussing the assignment, commitments and technical details as well as evaluating the results becomes exponential as more people get added. These observations are from Brooks' experiences while managing the development of OS-360 at IBM. Then in 1984, the theory of constraints was introduced by Dr. Eliyahu M. Goldtrat in his novel The Goal. Theory of constraints is an overall management philosophy that is geared to help organizations continually achieve their goal. The title comes from the view that any manageable system is limited in achieving more of its goal by a small number of constraints and there is always at least one constraint. The TOC process seeks to identify the constraint and restructure the rest of the organization around it by using five focusing steps. The methods and algorithms from TOC went on to form the basis of critical change project management. Then in 1986, Scrum was named as a project management style. This was definitely the game changer. You must all be aware of Scrum. It is an agile software development model based on multiple teams working in an intensive and interdependent manner. In their paper, The New New Product Development Game, Takeuchi and Nonaka named Scrum as a project management style. Later, they elaborated on it in the Knowledge Creating Company. Although Scrum is intended for management of software development projects, it can be used to run software maintenance teams or as a general project and program management approach. In 1987, a guide to the project management body of knowledge was published by PMI. So first published by the PMI as a white paper in 1987, the PMBOK guide was an attempt to document and standardize accepted project management information and practices. The first edition was published in 1996, followed by a second one in 2000 and a third one in 2004. The guide is one of the most essential tools in the project management profession today and has become the global standard for the industry. In 1989, Earned Value Management Leadership elevated to Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. Although the Earned Value concept has been around on factor flows since the early 1900s, it only came to prominence as a project management technique in the late 1980s to early 1990s. In 1989, EVM leadership was elevated to the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, thus making EVM an essential part of program management and procurement. In 1991, Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney cancelled the Navy A-12 Avenger 2 program because of performance problems detected by EVM. The PMBOK Guide of 1987 has an outline of earned value management subsequently expanded on in its later editions. In 1989, Print's method was developed from Prompt 2. Published by the UK government agency CCTA, projects in controlled environments became the UK standard for all government information systems projects. A feature of the original method not seen in other methods was the idea of assuring progress from three separate but linked perspectives. However, the Prince method developed a reputation for being too unwieldy, too rigid and applicable only to large projects, leading to a revision in 1996. In 1994, Chaos reported first published. The standardish group collects information on project failures in the information technology industry with the objective of making the industry much more successful than it already is, showing ways to improve its success rates and increase the value of IT investments. The Chaos Report is its biennial publication 
about IT project failure. In 1996, Prince 2 was published by CCTA. An upgrade to Prince was considered to be an order and the development was contracted out but assured by a virtual committee spread among 150 European organizations. Originally developed for information systems and information technology projects to reduce cost and time overruns, the second revision became more generic and applicable to any project type. In 1997, critical chain project management was invented. We've already discussed this. CCPM is based on methods and algorithms drawn from his theory of constraints introduced in his 1984 novel titled The Goal. A critical chain project network will keep the resources levelly loaded but will need them to be flexible in their start times and will switch quickly between tasks and task chains to keep the whole project on schedule. In 1998, PMBOK becomes a standard. The American National Standards Institute recognizes PMBOK as a standard in 1998 and later that year by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Moving on to 2001, the Agile Manifesto was written. In February 2001, 17 software developers met at the Lodge Snowbird Utah Resort to discuss lightweight software development methods. Here they published the Manifesto for Agile Software Development to define the approach now known by the same name. Some of the manifesto's authors form the Agile Alliance, a non-profit organization that really promotes software development according to the manifesto's 12 core principles. In 2006, Total Cost Management Framework was released by AACE International. Total Cost Management is the name given by AACE International to a process for applying the skills and knowledge of cost engineer. It is also the first integrated process or method of portfolio, program and project management. AACE first introduced the idea in the 1990s and published the full presentation of the process in the Total Cost Management Framework. Moving on to 2008, the fourth edition of PMBOK Guide release. The fourth edition of the guide continues the PMI tradition of excellence in project management with a standard that is easier to understand and implement with improved consistency and greater clarification. The updated version has two new processes, not in the previous version. And in 2009, a major Prince 2 revision was incorporated by Office of Government Commerce. A major revision has seen the method made simpler and more easily customizable, a frequent request from users. The updated version has seven basic principles that contributes to project success. Overall, the updated method aims to give project managers a better set of tools to deliver projects on time, within budget and with right quality. In 2012, the ISO 21500 2012 Guidance Standard for Project Management was released. In September 2012, to be exact, the International Organization for Standardization published ISO 21500 2012 Guidance on Project Management. It is the result of five years' work by experts from more than 50 countries. The standard is designed for use by any organization, including public, private or community groups, and for any project, regardless of complexity, size and duration. In 2012, the fifth edition of PMBOK released. The fifth edition of Guide, published in December 2012, provides guidelines, rules and characteristics for project management recognized as good practice in the profession. The updated version introduces a 10th knowledge area called Project Stakeholder Management and also includes four new planning processes. In 2017, the 6th edition of PMBOK Guide was released and moving on in 2021, the 7th edition of PMBOK Guide will be released. The 7th edition, unlike the other editions, will have different performance domains. It will have additional topics like models, artifacts and it has many other new principles that have been incorporated into it. Now that we know the history of project management, let's move on to the next part of the session and discuss why project management. Firstly, project management allows you to increase and work on collaboration. With clear roles, responsibilities and standardized templates, project management helps teams to form quickly and work very well together towards a particular goal. Collaboration with other teams or business units becomes easier as everyone is speaking the same language and using the same tool. The second reason is because of effective project planning. A well-developed project plan creates a realistic timeline, improves resource management, 
provides a baseline for tracking as the project progresses and leads to accurate budget estimates. In addition, data from previous projects is a valuable input into future project planning. The third reason is it has standardized ways of working. In the absence of clear approach to projects, individuals will get creative and develop their own ways of working, leading to multiple styles in one organization. A standardized project approach supported by the right tool will increase transparency in project selection, simplify project planning with templates, help team members to move very quickly between projects, improve collaboration within and between teams, and eventually improve visibility and reporting. The fourth reason is it allows you to successfully change management. Change management increases the end user adoption of a solution created by a project. Now, for example, using a company intranet or new document management software. When included in the project planning and throughout the project, change management makes it easier to deliver real business value from projects. Change management also reduces the impact of scope creep or uncontrolled changes to the project. Involving key stakeholders and users from the outset reduces the likelihood of delivering an unusable product. Project management will also enable better risk management. Using project manager processes, teams can identify potential risks way before the work even actually begins. If these risks affect the project during execution, the team is better placed to detect and address the problem as early as possible. And if project management practice is involved in the most effective manner, you can definitely see an improved quality. Project management helps to align outcomes with stakeholder expectations, gather feedback on a regular basis, and leverage new technologies to deliver better quality solutions. Documented processes also help to reduce errors and rework. There'll also be an improved reputation. In time, successful project teams gain the recognition of their colleagues and managers. Organizations also benefit from an increased standing among their competitors and future clients. Leadership is the most important aspect in project management. Project managers unite the team behind a clear vision and keep everyone motivated. Project managers can coach and mentor the team as needed so they can do their best work. Finally, it will incorporate new organizational capabilities. Improving project management processes is not just about financial gains. Organizations can also transform internal culture and the ways of working. Modern work is best described as a set of self-managed tasks. Introducing project management really helps organizations shift to focus on goals, metrics, and processes to support the execution of these tasks. Moving ahead, we will understand who really is a project manager. Project managers are organized, passionate, and goal-oriented people who understand what projects have in common and their strategic role in how organizations succeed, learn, and change. Basically, project managers are change agents. They make project goals their own and use their skills and expertise to inspire a sense of shared purpose within the project team. They enjoy the organized adrenaline of new challenges and the responsibility of driving business results. They work very well under pressure and are comfortable with change and complexity in dynamic environments. They can shift readily between the big picture and the small but crucial details, knowing when to concentrate on each of them. Project managers cultivate the people's skills needed to develop trust and communication among all of a project's stakeholders. It sponsors those who will make use of the project's results, those who command the resources needed, and the project team members. They also have a very, very broad and flexible toolkit of techniques, resolving complex interdependent activities into tasks and subtasks that are documented, monitored, and controlled. They adapt their approach to the context and constraints of each project, knowing that no one size can fit all the variety of projects. And they're always improving their own and their team skills through lessons learned reviews at project completion. Project managers are found in every kind of organization as employees, managers, contractors, and independent consultants. With experience, they may become program managers or portfolio managers. And the demand of project managers is increasing exponentially all around the world. For decades, as the pace of economic and technological change has quickened, organizations have been directing more and more of their energy into projects rather than routine operations. Today, senior executives and HR managers recognize project management 
as a strategic competence that is indispensable to business success. They know that skilled and credentialed practitioners are among their most valuable resources. So now let's discuss some of the skills of a project manager. Firstly, the project manager should become a very strategic business partner. He or she must also encourage and recognize the valuable contribution of others in the project. He or she must respect and motivate stakeholders and even give them insights time to time. He must stress on integrity and accountability of the project. He or she must also fully be invested in the success of the project and they must definitely have the talent to be able to work in the gray areas. The high level of skills and responsibilities of project managers has garnered high salaries. According to PMI's ninth edition salary survey, the annual median US project manager salary was about $108,000. So here's a list of annual medium salaries by certification status and experience. As you can see, the project management professional will allow you to completely skill up and the median salary is about $111,000. PMP with less than one year of experience gives you a median salary of about $95,000. PMP between one to five years of experience gives you around $104,000. The median salary of PMP professional with five to 10 years of experience will give you a median salary of $120,000. Moving on, PMP professionals with 10 to 20 years of experience should expect a median salary of about $124,000. And finally, PMP professionals with over 20 years of experience can easily expect a median salary of $133,000. Now that we've also discussed the salary of a project manager, let's move on to the next part of the session and discuss project management tools. As you may have noticed, projects can be sometimes really complicated. You plan, schedule and monitor to make sure all elements of the project are running smoothly. The more tools in hand, the more manageable the project and your task can be. Project management software can contain all the tools that are needed to help project managers and team members with every aspect of their projects. When that project management software is cloud-based, data and collaboration can happen in real time which really provides a more accurate picture of the project and helps in decision making. Plus, project management software often contains many of the major tools for managing projects like the ones that we'll be talking about. The first one is real-time dashboards. Now, project dashboards gather metrics from all parts of the project. Those numbers are then displayed in easy-to-read charts and graphs, giving managers or a team member a live look at the project progress and data. Dashboards can also assist in reporting. Running a project means reporting to the project sponsors on the progress of the project. Graphs and charts can be filtered to deliver just the data you need for targeted reports. The next tool that can really be handy in a project is online Gartt charts. These charts are great tools for planning because they display your task list graphically over a timeline. Each task has a deadline which creates a line marking the start and finish of that particular task. These tasks can then be linked if dependent. Ideally, you can share the Gantt with your team and track their progress as they update their statuses. With some of these Gantt charts, the bar between the start and finish dates will fill in as the team works on their tasks. And if you need to change the schedule, you can simply drag and drop the bar to reflect the new due date. The next tool is task management tools. There are several task management tools that allow you to create to-do lists for yourself and assign tasks to your team members. These tasks can sometimes have notes, files, links, and images attached that relate to the task. And team members can dialogue and collaborate at the task level. You can also automate email notifications to really know when a task is completed and to remind people of impending deadlines. The next tool is timesheets and workload tools. In terms of managing the people working on the project, which can be a project by itself, there are timesheets. These are online documents that make it easy for each employee to track and record their hours worked and they can be filed to the manager when complete for sign off. When it comes to managing the workload, resource allocation tools really allow you to see at a glance if you've allocated your resources properly across the project so that everyone is working and the workload is properly balanced. In some cases, you can run reports from your workload management software too. Now that we've discussed some of the tools that a project manager could use, to really get an insight of how well the project is doing, 
let's move ahead and talk about one important part of project management that is its life cycle. So there are three steps to this life cycle. The first one is initiation. The second one is planning. Third one is execution. And the last one is closure. We'll be talking about each of these in detail. So whether you're working on a small project with modest business goals or a multi-departmental initiative with sweeping corporate implications, an understanding of this management cycle is essential. The first one is initiation. First, you'll really have to identify a business need, problem or opportunity and brainstorm ways that your team can meet this need, solve this problem or seize this opportunity. During this step, you figure out an objective for your project, determine whether the project is feasible and identify the major deliverables for the project. Clearly, it is worth it to do what it takes to make your voice heard early before the strategy is set in stone. There are some project management steps for the initiation phase. Firstly, undertake a feasibility study. That is, identify the primary problem your project will solve and whether your project will deliver a solution to that particular problem. The second one is identifying scope. Define the depth and breadth of the project. The third step is to identify deliverables. That is, define the product or service to provide. The fourth step is to identify project stakeholders. Figure out whom the project affects and what their needs may be. The fifth step is develop a business case. Use the criteria that I just mentioned to compare the potential costs and benefits for the project to determine if it moves forward. Finally, develop a statement of work. That is, document the project's objectives, scope and deliverables that you have identified previously as a working agreement between the project owner and those working on the project. Now, in the life cycle, the second step is planning. Now, once the project is approved to move forward based on your business case, statement of work or project initiation document, you move on to the next step that is planning phase. Now, during this phase of the project management life cycle, you break down the larger project into smaller tasks, build your team and prepare a schedule for the completion of assignments. Create smaller goals within the larger project, making sure each is achievable within the time frame. Smaller goals should definitely have a higher potential for success. There are some certain steps that you will have to follow in the planning phase too. The first one is to create a project plan. Identify the project timeline, including the phases of the project, the tasks to be performed, and the possible constraints that we discussed in the previous part of the session. The second step is to create workflow diagrams. Visualize your processes using swim lanes to make sure team members clearly understand the role within a project. The third one is to estimate budget and create a financial plan. This is really important. You will have to use cost estimates to really determine how much to spend on the project to get the maximum return on investment. The next step is to gather resources. Build your functional team from internal and external talent pools while making sure everyone has the necessary tools to complete their tasks. The next is to anticipate risks and potential quality roadblocks. Identify issues that may cause your project to stall while planning to mitigate those risks and maintain the project's quality and timeline. The last step is to hold a project kickoff meeting. Bring your team on board and outline the project so they can quickly get to work. So now moving on, you've received a business approval, developed a plan and build your team. Now is the time to get to work. The execution phase turns your plans into actions. The project manager's job in this phase of the project management life cycle is to keep work on track, organize team members, manage timelines and really make sure the work is done according to the original plan. There are some steps that you'll have to follow in the execution phase of the life cycle too. The first one is to create tasks and organizing workflows. Assign granular aspects of the projects to the appropriate team members, making sure team members are not overworked. Then you will have to brief team members on tasks. Explain tasks to team members, providing necessary guidance on how they should be completed and organize process-related training if required. The next step is to communicate with team members, clients and upper management. Provide updates frequently to project stakeholders at all levels. Also, you will have to monitor quality of work. Ensure that team members are meeting their time and quality goals for tasks. Finally, manage budget. Monitor spending and keeping the project on track in terms of assets and resources. If you have a properly documented process already in place, executing the project will be much easier. Finally, in the last step of the life cycle, we have closure. Now, once your team has completed work on a project, 
you enter the closure phase. In this phase, you provide final deliverables, release project resources, and determine the success of the project. Just because the major project work is over, that doesn't mean the project manager's job is done here. There are still some important things to do, including evaluating what did and did not work with the project. So he'll have to firstly analyze project performance, determine whether the project's goals were met and the initial problems solved using a prepared checklist. Then you'll also have to analyze team performance, evaluate how team members performed, including whether they met their goals along with timeliness and quality of work. Moving on, you will also have to document project closure. Make sure that all aspects of the project are completed with no loose ends remaining. And here you'll also have to provide reports to key stakeholders. Moving on, you will have to conduct post-implementation reviews where you conduct a final analysis of the project, taking into account lessons learned for similar projects in the future. Finally, accounting for used and unused budget. You will have to allocate remaining resources for future projects. By remaining on task, even though the project's work is completed, you will be prepared to take everything you've learned and implement it for your next project. Now that we have discussed the various project management tool, let's go ahead and check out the project principles. Now that we've discussed the life cycle, let's go ahead and talk about the project management principles. There are 12 project management principles. The first one is stewardship, where you're expected to be a diligent, respectful and caring steward. The second principle is team. Build a culture of accountability and respect. The third one is stakeholders. You will constantly have to engage stakeholders to really understand the interests and needs. The fourth principle is value. You will always have to focus on value. Throughout the project, it is really important to keep up the value. The fifth principle is holistic thinking. Recognize and respond to the system's interactions. The sixth principle is leadership. Here you'll have to motivate, influence, coach and learn. The seventh principle is tailoring, where you will have to tailor the delivery approach based on the context. The eighth one is quality. It is important to build quality into the processes and results. That is the outcome. The ninth principle is complexity. You will have to address complexity using your technical knowledge, your experience, and also the learning throughout the project. The tenth principle is opportunities and threats. You will have to address opportunities and threats throughout the entire process. The 11th principle is adaptability and resilience. It is important for you to be adaptable and resilient throughout the project. The last principle is change management. You will have to enable change whenever it is required to achieve the envisioned future state. Now that we have discussed the 12 main principles in project management, let's move ahead and check out the performance domains in project management. The first performance domain is team. The second one is stakeholders. Third one is the project life cycle itself. The fourth one is planning. The fifth one is navigating uncertainty and ambiguity. The sixth one is delivery. The seventh one is performance. And the last one is project work. So these are all the roles and factors that contribute to the project success. Now, moving on to the last part of the session, we have project management certifications. In an increasingly projectized world, PMI professional certification ensures that you are ready to meet the demands of projects and employers across the globe. Developed by practitioners for practitioners, these certifications are based on rigorous standards and ongoing research to meet the real world needs of your organizations. With a PMI certification behind your name, you can work in virtually any industry, anywhere in the world, and with any project management methodology. Wherever you are in your career, they have a certification for you. There are several certifications that PMI offers. Some of them are the Project Management Professionals, that is PMP. You have the Certified Associate in Project Management, that's CAPM. These are the two most prominent certifications that the PMI offers. You also have PMI PBA, you also have PGMP, that is Program Management Professional, and many other certifications. Edureka's PMP online course gives you extensive knowledge of project management concepts that are highlighted in the PMBOK guide and is aligned with the latest PMP exam content outline. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and register in Edureka's PMP certification course today. With this, we come to the end of today's session on Project Management 101. If you have any queries, feel free to leave them in the comment section below and we will get back to you as soon as possible.
Until next time, thank you.